So last week we saw the amazing news. And just as a reminder, and I thought actually Psalm 103 that Chris read this morning was, was an awesome summary of the amazing news and covered actually a number of these points. That, you know, when, when we are in Christ, we can be free from fear. In Christ, he has taken away the, the wall of hostility between us and God, which is sin. He has forgiven our sin and given us peace, peace that is beyond what anyone can comprehend. Not only has that, but, but he gives us something inside, a joy that, that goes beyond circumstances in Christ that that uh, in Christ we have eternal life that we don't have to be afraid of tomorrow and what does the future hold that when we begin to follow Christ we know and we can have a certainty that our future is going to be amazingly good amazingly good we don't have to fear for the future and in fact in Christ we can also know his love the love of Christ that that is deep you know I, I love in fact Psalm 103 that Chris was reading and and Exodus uh, chapter 20 and Deuteronomy 5 where where God is talking about his name and he is the God of love he is the covenant love. He is slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And that is just part of who he is. And when, when we come to Christ, we get to experience that love firsthand. It's not just a, a theory or something that we're looking for or searching for. It's something that we can experience. I remember, you know, when um, I, I told you about when I, my father passed away and how shocking that was. But when God spoke to me and said, now I am going to be your father he filled up a love inside of my heart and at so many times in my life I've been able to come into God's presence and just sit in the presence of his love and and it's amazing <laughs> what God's love does for us not only that he gives us a sense of purpose he has created for good created us for good works and we know that we have meaning we have belonging Longing, we have purpose in Christ Jesus. So there is just amazing news, amazingly incredible news in Christ Jesus. And last week we we came and and we we saw the the challenge, right? The challenge is if there is this amazingly great news, then how can we be silent? How can we not tell those people around us? How can we we not be reaching out isn't that actually a form in, of hatred and so I challenge us each one to to consider each day and to pray each day God give me someone today to share your good news with now the point of that is not to get you guilty so that in a given day, if you don't share Christ with somebody that you feel that, oh, I'm a failure. No, but it's, it's, a per, it's an outlook in life to say, God, show me. Instead of, you know, occasionally show me, every day we should have the attitude of, today, God, who do you want me to speak to? Bring somebody my way. Because the, the fact is that opportunities are all around us, but our eyes need to be open to see them. But the problem that we have is we're a little bit afraid. It's like, uh, okay, but, but what am I supposed to say? <laughs> you know, if I have somebody, you know, what am I supposed to say? When should I say it? Who should I say it to? How should I say it? I mean, we get afraid. We're worried. We don't, we think, I, I don't know the right words to say. I, I don't know what to do. Um, well, there's some great news. First off, 
You know, it's actually not our words that are going to change people's heart anyhow. <laughs> There's been so many times where I've totally tripped over my words and said things that were just like totally confusing, but God's still working in that person's heart. <laughs> because it's really God. He wants us to be walking alongside him and, and working. Really, God, the Holy Spirit, is the one who's there changing hearts. Now, you know, um, sometimes at my work, when I'm, I'm training people, I, I like to use the method that Jesus did when he trained people, which was, first, I'm going to show you what to do. So he showed his disciples. They watched him. And then after a while, he said, hey, come along with me and help now. So like when he was feeding the 5,000, <clears> he said, you feed them. And they were like, what? Woo! We don't know what to do. And so he said, well, you pass, have them sit down. So he gave them little tasks that they could do to be a part of his ministry. And really, that's what God is doing with us. He's, he's leading us along and giving us ways to walk beside him. And he's doing the work. And we may be just passing out some fish or talking or bumbling or doing whatever. But as long as we're there, God is working. Okay, as long as we say yes. So here's the thing. God, first of all, God is the one who's working. Second of all, we've got some really great examples of how Jesus did it. You've heard of what would Jesus do, right? There's that wristband and everything. What would Jesus do? Well, we can look and see what did Jesus actually do? And that's how we can learn. So what I'm going to do today is break down. We're going to look at this passage really closely because there's a, a beginner's course and an advanced course in sharing the good news. I mean, Jesus breaks it down. It's just incredible. This is a passage. And so we're going to look in the, the two places. Now, the first one is actually the advanced example. It's Jesus talking to this Samaritan woman. And then we're going to see somebody who's a total beginner, a total novice, just learned moments before about Jesus. So when you and I think, yeah, but I don't, I don't know the right words to say. Well, she knew even less. <laughs> okay. So let's take a look. So, Jesus. So let's open, if you have your Bible with you, um, open up and let's look at uh, John chapter 4. John chapter 4. <clears throat> starting in verse 1. So, starting in verse 1. It says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisee, Pharisees has heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but it was his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Okay, so just to set the stage here, Jesus was down in Judea, which is down in the south, southern regions of Israel. That's where Jerusalem is. And where he hung out most of the time was up north in Galilee. And between Jerusalem and Judea down in the south, and up in the north where he's going, he's going back to his hometown, which was, uh, he hung out a lot in Capernaum, up in Galilee. Um, he spent a lot of time. Anyhow, he's now heading back from the south, and he has to go through Samaria. That's right in the middle. So now we're in verse 4. So he's going from Judea, and he's going back to Galilee. So then in verse 4 it says, now he had to go through Samaria because it's right in the middle. Now Samaria, again, just as a backdrop, Samaria is the, the area where um, back when the Israel was taken captive into Babylonia, 
um, and Assyria, the kings of Assyria and Babylon brought in all of these other nations to come and live there. So they exported some of the Israelites, some were still there, and they brought in all of these other people to come and live there. And they began worshiping their own gods, and so there was this real mixture. And in fact, the people now who are left in Samaria were the remnants of those persons who were from other countries. They were worshiping other gods plus uh, the God of Israel. And so those Jews who came back lived in the south, in Judah, and some up in the north. And they were like the enemies, these Samaritans, because they were like the, the mixture. They were the people who didn't really worship God. They weren't Jewish. They were this mixture. And, you know, if you go back and read the law, you're not, they weren't supposed to intermarry. Um, but in fact, this group, so um, in fact, they were hated. Uh, so that Israelites, you'll, we'll see in a minute here that it was illegal, quote unquote, for an Israelite to even talk to a Samaritan. I mean, that wasn't God's law, but that was part of the law that they had developed. So now Jesus is going through Samaria, backdrop, and let's continue reading. So verse 4, now he had to go through Samaria, and when he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground, Joseph had given to his son Joseph. Okay, so he's coming along, he comes to Sychar, and it says in verse 6, Jacob's well was there, and and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. So middle of the day, it's hot. They've been walking all day. You know, they don't have Uber. They don't have cars. They don't even have bicycles. You know, he's walking. It's a long walk, multiple days. And so it's hot. You know, think about... Georgia in the middle of the summer, you know, walking out in the middle of that, you're hot. So he gets to this well, a place to sit down, some shade. He sits down there at the well. Okay, and then in verse 7, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? And in parentheses, a little side note, his disciples had gone into town to buy food. So they're on the outskirts of town. You know, the well was out there as they watered all the animals. This was not downtown. It's out in the outskirts. Um, and so he sits down there. The disciples go to get food. He's by himself. And he says, hey, you know, could you give me some water? And the woman, Samaritan woman, says to him in verse 9, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Okay, so she said, Hey, what are you doing? You can't talk to me. I mean, two reasons here. Jesus is breaking through actual two stereotypical problems. First of all, she's a Samaritan. Second of all, she's a woman. You know, men just didn't go up and talk to a woman who wasn't related to them. This is like breaking all of the cultural taboos here. So he's talking to this woman, and he sa she says, Hey, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. How you can't talk to me. What are you doing? And Jesus answered her in verse 10, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So I'm sure the woman is like, Huh? <laughs> what are you talking about? And the woman, sir, the woman says, you have nothing to draw water with, and this well is very deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? It's like, what? How can you get water out of this well? What kind of living? She's totally confused. You know, Jesus is talking up here. She's like, they're just passing. They have, she has no clue. And, but she's still asking, you know, what are you, what are you saying? And Jesus answered to her again, 
Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now the woman's like, oh, okay, wow, it, eternal water, she says, the woman says to him, sir, give me some of this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. It sounds like, you know, we've got some sort of plumbing. Is this, uh, you know, we got something that will come into my house or just turn it on. It's always there. You know, she's, sounds good. So she's probably not understanding yet, of course, what he's saying but she's interested. Give me some of this water. And Jesus told her, Go, call your husband and come back. Verse 17, he says, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said... Uh, what you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet because that was the situation. Jesus saw and knew that this, you know, all of her marital situations and, and he's, she says, I see that you're a prophet. And then she says, but, well, but hold on a second here. Now, remember, there's this problem between the Jews and the Samaritans. And she says, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. That's because up north, they worshipped there in Samaria. And that's where they had an altar set up. That was a part of the big division between the north and south of Israel. They had these idols there that they worshipped, and they said, these are God. And down in the south, you know, this is a big conflict. She's bringing it up. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that, in, that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So she's bringing up this division and tension, and Jesus says, um, says, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, and we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Okay, so this is the advanced course, and let's just now go back and break it down a bit because there's a lot of things to learn from this encounter. It's pretty incredible, pretty incredible what Jesus does. So first of all, you know, when we have the question, well, what am I going to say to people about the gospel? I don't know all about the gospel. You know, I don't know how to preach to them. I can't get up and preach for 30 minutes about Jesus and how to get saved. And, and the good news is, one, you don't have to, and two, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> Jesus didn't get up and preach to her, did he? Did Jesus preach to her? No. No. He had a conversation with her. Look how this conversation started. It started with something every day. He was thirsty and needed a drink. He said, hey, could you get me a drink? Now, notice in his doing that, he was going beyond a little bit of fears that you or I might have. So the first thing is, you know, we, just in our everyday life, we don't like to talk to people we don't know. <laughs> We're like, more like this woman. Hey, you're somebody I don't know. You're a stranger. Don't talk to me. 
but, but one of the first things that we need to do is, is take a step out and just talk to people. Hi, hello. It was funny because when I was in Estonia, um, I, you know, I learned how to say hello, which was in Estonian as Tere. So I would walk through the town and just to everybody I saw walking down the street, I'd say, Tere, 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 you know, and they just thought that was so hilarious because over there, you don't say hi to people walking down the street who you don't know, especially. That was just like really weird. But I was still just saying hi to everybody. Everybody. My vocabulary was small, but <laughs> I knew that. So I was just being friendly. And here's the thing. Have you ever had somebody just walk up to you and say hi who you didn't even know? Did you feel like, oh, why are you talking to me? No. I mean, every time it's happened to me, I've been like, oh, hi, how are you doing? People in general like to be greeted in a welcoming and friendly way, no matter if you know them or not. Just the other day I was here at um, a, a, a school event for Samantha, and I was standing there with all these parents. I didn't know a single one of them. And I was standing there, and you know, I could have just been sitting on my phone reading emails like everybody else around me was doing, looking on their phones, surfing the web, and, you know, not looking at the people around me. <laughs> but there was this guy standing next to me, and I just felt inside, hey, Nathaniel, you got to step out. <laughs> so I just turned to the guy and said, hi. And he put down his phone. He was looking at his phone, but he put down his phone, turned to me, and obviously was very wanting to engage in conversation. But we're all afraid. We're afraid of talking to each other, and these phones have become a crutch for us to hide behind. So we got to put down our phone and look at people and say, hi. You know, like when you go, to, if I get in an elevator at work, Everybody is looking at their phones. This is like, come on, people. Let's, you know, really? Can't we just talk? Hi. And the thing is that in our society today, people feel isolated. They feel alone. They may have a thousand friends on Facebook, but they still feel alone. And they're wanting to talk. They're wanting to have relationships, just like you do, just like I do. So the first step is to just say hi. <laughs> Jesus just said, hi, could you get me some water? He wasn't preaching. He wasn't going anywhere deep. All I said to this guy was, hi, um... Do you have a son or daughter here? You know, it was at some school function. So he started telling me all about his daughter, and we got into a long conversation, and by the end of the night, he's given me his phone number, and, and you know, Samantha came, and she's ready to go, and, you know, the dads are still talking. <laughs> So the first step is this conversation. Let's talk to people, say hi. People like to say hi. Every day, the opportunities are everywhere. You, you'll have people around you, you just walking down the street when you're in the grocery store, waiting in line, you got somebody behind you. Say, hey, hi, how you doing? Hey, you can do that. So, the next thing is observe the response. Now, some people aren't ready to talk, okay? Jesus did not talk to everybody in the Bible. But look how this woman responded every time she kept on asking questions. She kept on keeping the dialogue open. So Jesus was observing how she responded. Now sometimes, like I've been on an airplane, 
And it used to be back in the old days, before everybody had phones and things, you know, you could have these nice conversations with people. But nowadays, people put in the earbuds and leave me alone. <laughs> they do not want to be talked to. And fine, most people don't. And uh, in that situation, there's certain situations if people aren't wanting to talk, fine. You don't have to push your way in and say, oh, wait a second here. I need to tell you about the good news. Pull out their earbuds. <laughs> Let me tell you about the good news. You know, that's like, really? <laughs> no, but the thing is, and I love this, if you haven't read the book by... Um, Blackaby, Henry Blackaby. It's called Experiencing God. I love this book. One of the things that he says in here is he says, always be watching for where God is working. And when you see him working, join with him. And that's what we're doing when we're talking to people. We're waiting to see where God is working in somebody's heart. If God is working in their heart, they're going to talk back to you. They will respond. Just like this woman. The Holy Spirit was already working. We, don't, we can't convert somebody. We can't get them interested. But the great news is, when God's working, we'll see that. Now, that doesn't mean that the response is just going to be, please pray with me, brother. You know, <laughs> right? Hello! And they're going to say, please tell me the gospel. I want to get saved. No, in fact, look at what this woman did. She actually threw out a, a bit of a, a no, but she's still talking. She says, hey, you can't talk to me. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. Okay, so just because you get a no, as long as they're still talking, he said, okay, I hear you. Chill out. So he says, well, now here's what Jesus does, and he's the master of this. So he transitioned from the natural to the spiritual, from the temporal, this temporally, you know, the temporary water, and he transferred this conversation now to an eternal one. She was talking about water that you drink, and then he changes it to eternal water, living water. And he's just waiting to see how she responds. Now, if she would have said... Go get your own water. You know, fine. That would be the end of that conversation. Jesus wouldn't have hunted her down. There's many times that people said no to Jesus and walked away. There's many people who he didn't interact with. It's not our goal to convince them to follow God. All we need to do is be willing to be there to show up to talk to them. Say, okay, so the first thing, we say hello. The next thing, in our normal conversation, we look for an opportunity to transition from natural to spiritual, from temporal to eternal. And Jesus is a master at this. So here's some, some examples of how we might do that. So, Generally, what I find is that a short statement or a short question will, will help with this kind of transition. Notice how long Jesus' statements are when he's talking to this woman. At first, especially, they're like two sentences. He's not going on. And, you know, he could have, when she said, you know, I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew, he could have launched into, you know, probably I would have got caught up in that and said, oh, yeah, well, that's because the Jews are awesome. And, you know, <laughs> and let me tell you about, you know, and go, I'll go into a 20 points of why you Samaritans need to find the truth. You need to find the truth. You need to repent. <laughs> but no. 
about Jesus, just his little, little conversation. He's not preaching, he's talking, conversing back and forth, okay? So, um, so these uh, short spiritual statements, so one that I've used before, uh, what do you think about spiritual things? Kind of an open-ended question. You know, it's not intimidating. It's just something you can throw out there. Or in light of current things going on, like in Las Vegas and all of these other things, you might ask the question, why do you think people kill each other? You know, there's things going on in our world today, and there's an easy way to transform that statement of the things that are going on that are horrible when looking at them from the temporal standpoint to ask the long-term question of, why do you think people would do that? And let them talk. You don't need to tell them what you think. Let's just wait for that later. <laughs> You're talking to somebody. And if you care about them, you want to know who they are. So you open up the door just like Jesus did in a very masterful way. Um, you know, recently I had a friend who, uh, at work who his good friend just died suddenly. And obviously when somebody dies who you know, a lot of times the thoughts go to, man, what happens after this? I mean, that's a great question. What do you think happens after you die? Just let them talk. Let them understand and explain where they're coming from, what they believe. Because at this point, you're, you're talking to them. You're, you're building a relationship. And if you're preaching, I mean, if somebody just walked around to you, let's say your, your spouse or your best friend, and all they were doing you is telling you how you should live and what things you need to change, you know, that relationship would be like... They would be like irritated at you all the time because they want to tell you about them. They want to tell you about their life. This is what happened to me. So we got to let people talk. This is about forming a relationship. So at the end of the day, we're conversing with people. We're not preaching. We're having a conversation. We have to step outside of our, our comfort zone, our fear zone, and just say hi. And two, we have to just talk. Don't preach. Talk to them. Ask questions that will get them. And don't get sidetracked. Oh my goodness, this woman was trying to sidetrack Jesus and I would have fallen for it hook line and sinker you know not only did she start off by saying you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan you know that's like throwing it out there and then later on after he starts talking about who he is you know um, after uh, she says wow you're a prophet but our people worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say you've got to worship. So she was trying to bring up, and the devil does this, brings up smoke screens, brings up fights, wanting to get you arguing with them. I mean, the devil does this. I mean, you probably experience it in your relationships right now. As if the devil can get you arguing, you've lost. This is not about arguing. Jesus did not argue with this lady. He could have argued with her at any point along here, but each time he intentionally did not. He did not argue with her. Arguing is not what this is about. We're about sharing the good news. Okay? So don't get sidetracked. You don't have to answer every question. Jesus did, he just let that one hang out there. He moved right along kept talking to her okay and then as the conversation goes as you see Jesus he kept on bringing this conversation a bit deeper you know first he transitions into um, into the spiritual side and says 
well, I've got a living water, and she's not sure what on earth he's talking about, but she's still talking, right? She's still, and then he says, anyone who drinks this water, so he's trying to bring her back to the eternal. You know, no, you're not understanding me. I'm not talking about the physical water. There's eternal water. And in fact, it's a water that will last you to eternity. And she's like, oh, I don't have to drink, go, don't have to go to this well. Interesting. And then, and then is the invitation, okay? The invitation to go deeper. Jesus says to her, go get your husband, okay? Because he knows that it would be inappropriate for him to be going too deep. You know, this woman, if she has a husband, he needs to be there. Said, so go call your husband. Come. She didn't, you know, if she didn't care, she would have said, nah, see you later. But no. And then we have this whole, this whole interaction of, well, the guy who I have right now isn't really my husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. He goes, well, you're right. <laughs> Now, what's interesting here is in the middle of this conversation, there's supernatural breaks in. God speaks to him. Don't be surprised that if in the middle of you talking to somebody, if you're walking alongside God and, and watching him work, God's the one working. He's going to do supernatural stuff. Whether that's just convincing them or talking to them. In this case, God spoke to Jesus and he knew, okay, yep, this one that you have now isn't your husband. In fact, you've had, uh, in fact, you've had five husbands and this guy isn't your husband. Just a little statement. And, and she says, whoa, I, I can see you're a prophet. She knew God was there. But even without that, she's talking. She's interacting. But, but watch for God doing miraculous. And then three, remove obstacles. She's trying to throw up this obstacle right after that and say, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain and yours did not. And Jesus totally diffused that obstacle and says, you know what? There will come a time when nobody's going to be worshiping on either of these mountains. He's got rid of that argument. God is looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not about these things that we're arguing about. It's not about where. This is about God. This is about him. And he's the one who we need to know. Jesus takes her past, removes the obstacle, removes it. And, you know, we'll talk in, in later weeks about obstacles. There's a lot of common obstacles that people have. And knowing how to get past some obstacles is good. But at the end of the day, you don't have to fight. You don't have to argue. Just keep coming back to Jesus. Because Jesus is God. God is the one who we're talking. It's not about what wrong people have done in the Crusades, or it's not about the people in Africa who haven't heard, or it's not about, you know, all of the other religions. It's not about, uh, you know, all of these are, are th things that people will throw up. You know, what about, you know, Darwinism and evolution? All of these are some of those things. It's like, okay, let's get back to Jesus. Do you know, what do you think about him? Who do you think he is? He came, claimed to be God. And he proved that he was God by dying on the cross and rising from the dead. What do you think about him? So, this is the advanced course. And you might be like, oh, there's an awful lot to remember there. That's eight points. <laughs> 
I don't know if I could keep up with Jesus. Well, the good thing is, this is, again, the advanced course. We don't start out here. Let's go now to the beginner course, where you and I can be at, and it's so easy. <laughs> this woman was bringing people to Jesus who got saved, so let's keep reading. Um, at, so there's a little break in the text here um, in verse verse 26 where we left off um, Jesus said you know she said I know that the Messiah is coming and Jesus said that's who I am I'm the Messiah and then there's this interlude where the disciples come back and they're like what what are you talking to this woman what's going on here Jesus and they're talking about food and meanwhile the lady is going off she's going back home to talk to get her husband Jesus told her to go get her husband well she doesn't have a husband so he's she's going off to tell people and now let's look so starting in um, verse 39 then let's pick up there so this woman meanwhile sorry this woman meanwhile has gone off to talk to people and her message was simple Okay, so from verse 39, it says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So what did she do? She went back to town and said, This guy told me everything I ever did. Now, did Jesus tell her everything she ever did? No, but, but it was like amazing to her that God knew, Jesus knew about her marriage and so that, you know, got expanded out because she was excited. She was excited about what God had done and so she, all she's doing is going and telling people, look what, look what he did for me. And so it says, so because of that, many Samaritans believed in him. And so then in verse 40, so when the Samaritans came to him, so there's actually an implicit statement there that's not stated directly. Um, this woman was talking to Jesus. She went and tells them, and all she's doing and going back to people in her town who she knows and says, Look what Jesus did for me. And so all we have to do is tell us, tell our story. What did Jesus do for you? What has Jesus done for you? That's all you have to do. That's all I have to do. When we're talking to people, you know, we can talk to them and say, Hey, how you doing? Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. Now, you don't have to start the conversation there. But look for the opportunities to tell people, man, this is what Jesus did for me. You don't have to lecture. You don't have to know all of the four spiritual laws. You don't have to have the book of Romans memorized. But you can say to somebody, hi, how you doing? Be friendly to them and talk to them just like you do. You all know how to have conversations with people. So you talk to people, and then when things come up, you say, and actually, Debbie was just talking to me about this last week. She said, you know, I don't know what to say to them, but, and she, of course, knows what to say to them, and she says, I just say to them, if I were you, because people, when they're talking to you, they'll start telling you about problems they have, things that they're going through in life. You know, what's going on? And so then she said, well, I would just say, I just said to them, if I was you, this is what I would do. I would pray. If I was you, I would cry out and ask God for help. Hey, woo, home run. Because that's all that we need to do is tell people where to go and get help. Isn't this, that what this lady did here? If I was you... That's what I would do because when I've been in bad situations before, God has helped me. This woman didn't have a long story. You don't have to tell a long thing. She did two things. She told what God did for her, and she told people where to find Jesus. 
So you can do that too. Where to find him? If I was you, I would pray. I would go and pray. You know what is really good that I've found to be good? Reading the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, hey, can get you one. In fact, when I was in college, one of the things that I would do um, is uh, intentionally be going out and just going across campus and looking for people who were sitting there. And I'd go walk up to them and say, hey, how you doing? I'm just going around campus asking people a few questions. You have a few minutes? Oh, sure. You know, they're just sitting out there. They, so what do you think about God? Who do you think God is? Who do you think Jesus is? So, very simple question. And then from there, we'd have a little conversation about who Jesus is, who they thought he was, and... And very often then I'd say, hey, you know, I've been having a discussion with people each week where we just get together and look at what Jesus actually said because most people have actually never read the Bible. You know, most people who go to church in America have never read the Bible for themselves. All that they hear is what is told to them on Sunday mornings. Most never read the Bible. It's a very, very small percentage. So most people don't really know what the Bible says. So hey, do you want to get together and see what Jesus actually said? <laughs> um, but it's very simple. Tell your story and bring her along. Bring somebody along. And you can bring, invite them. If you don't know what to say, you can invite them like Debbie did. Hey, pray and ask God for help. That's what I'd recommend. Or two, hey, do you want to come to church with me on Sunday or come to a Bible study or other things that you're doing? Um, or just talk, you know, have a... Let's, let's meet again. I want to pray for you and see what's going on. Because people are dying. You know, in this, even though America is a quote-unquote Christian country, the percentage of people who actually know Jesus is minuscule. The number who go to church is probably now less than 50%. I don't know the current numbers. And of those who actually go to church, even most of them don't even know Jesus. I mean, the polls of what people think about God and what they understand of him, of Christians, is just like, oh my goodness. These people aren't even worshiping the God of the Bible. It's like, <laughs> this is like something totally different. You know, the Samaritans knew more about God than they did. They do. And our nation, all around us, people are dying. And they need somebody to share with them the good news. So, John 40 and 41, just to close out this section, I think is quite powerful. Because Jesus, remember what he was doing? He was walking with his disciples from Judea up to Galilee. That's where his home was, okay? He's heading there with his disciples. They stopped here to, because it was hot. And now look at what happened. So um, in verse 40, it says, So when the Samaritans came to him, because obviously she told him them where he was, brought them along and he so they so when the samaritans came to him they urged him to stay with him and he stayed for 2 days so what's going on there jesus interrupted his plans because god was working god was working there and he said wait a second <laughs> I'm staying here because God is doing something in these people. And so when we're going about our busy lives and we see that God is doing something, we need to just stop the train. 
say, okay, God, I want to be where you are. I, I mean, that's powerful. Jesus interrupted his schedule because God was at work. And that's part of that thing that uh, Henry Blackaby talks about in that experiencing God. Our goal, you and me, our goal is to see where God is working. And when we see it, we just go there and hang out <laughs> and watch him work. And that, I mean, we see miracles. We see incredible stuff because God is at work. And it's incredible. So, let's pray. The Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, that the Father... This sharing of the amazing news sometimes makes us afraid and uncertain. But Lord, I pray that you will open our eyes to see that it's you who's doing the work. That all we have to do is share, to talk, to say what you've done for us. Because, Lord, you are an amazing God. So open our eyes, Lord, to the situations and the people around us. Help us to see, Lord God, those opportunities that are around us each day. And help us to actually love, to actually love the people who are around us. Help us to actually believe your good news and to love. So I pray, Father, for your strength and for your encouragement. And I pray that you will lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's more that we're going to talk about in upcoming weeks. Uh, this is something that is really important. It's really easy at one level, but it's also really deep. There's a lot that we can do. Again, I don't want you to feel guilty or condemned because on a given day you didn't have the opportunity to share with somebody. But I would say each day still, it's, a, it's an outlook. And what I found is that when I share with people and I start changing my view to, to be looking for people and opportunities, they, they just will appear all around you. You'll be shocked. Whereas before, you know, you sail through life and you, it's like, man, I didn't have any opportunities to talk to somebody today. <laughs> That's because our eyes are closed. So we're going to pray and ask God to open our eyes. Jesus said that the fields are ripe under the harvest. And we look around and we think, man, these fields look like they've already been mowed over and burned. They're like dead. But no, the harvest is there. We need to just have our eyes open to see where God is working. So let me pray. God, I pray that you will bless your people. I pray that you will cause your face to shine on your people today. And I pray, Father God, that you will bless and encourage. And I pray that you will grant your favor to rest on your people. That you will lead us, Lord, by your mercy. And lead us into your peace that we can have the hope and joy in Christ Jesus. We thank you. Amen. All right.